So hello and welcome to the fifth webinar in our 2015 High Tunnel webinar series. I'm Miranda Combs and I'm an Extension Associate with the Center for Crop Diversification at the University of Kentucky. Today we'll learn about insect, weed, and disease control in high tunnels. Dr. Rick Besson will start us off by talking about insect pests and how to deal with them. Then Sean Wright will share information about weeds and controlling them. And finally, Dr. Kenny Siebold will talk about diseases and ways to control their spread in high tunnel systems. I'd like to let everyone know that a copy of tonight's presentation is available for download in the files pod in the left corner of your screen. I also want to remind everyone that the recordings of our past four webinars are available on the Center for Crop Diversification website along with the documents referenced during each webinar. Please visit our website and navigate to our new webinars page. All the archived webinars will be available in the right column of that page. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. To ask questions, simply type your questions into the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen. Christy Cassidy from the Center for Crop Diversification will be helping us answer questions throughout the presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available in a few days on the Center for Crop Diversification's webinars page. Finally, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a survey link available for you to provide some feedback for us. We really appreciate and listen to the feedback you provide. We hope you enjoy the presentation and take away some great information. Without any further ado, I will hand the presentation over to Dr. Rick Besson. Welcome, Rick. Well, good evening. Uh, I was going to talk uh, about uh, greenhouse or high tunnel insect pests, and I'm going to take this from the, the position that uh, many of you are new to uh, uh, high tunnel production and may have some familiarity with growing some of these crops in the field, and it's a bit different when we move into the high tunnel. And one of the key differences is that we have a small group of pests that can be very serious problems in the high tunnel. In the field, uh, they are rarely pests, but in the high tunnel, uh, they're, they're very problematic. And in, in most seasons, uh, growers will experience one or more of these pests within their high tunnel. And the reason is why we see these specific pests in the high tunnel, these tend to be pests with very short life cycles. Uh, which means, you know, every uh, five days or 14 days, they're able to complete a generation, uh, lay a complement of eggs, and, and we see a rapid buildup. We also find that natural enemies can be excluded in the greenhouse, and so these pests are able to expand in number without their natural enemies uh, limiting their population growth. Because they have short life cycles, uh, that means that we often have to spray more often for them. Uh, it allows them to uh, develop resistance uh, faster to some of our pesticides. They also have the ability with these short life cycles to recover quite quickly after a spray that, it, you know, in another week, they can complete another generation of, uh, in, in the high tunnel. Some of these pests uh, are vectors of disease, so they're going to move pathogens around that, that cause disease on certain types of crop plants. Uh, thrips, we have four main species in the high tunnel, and some of these uh, uh, can vector tomato spotted wilt virus at, at, at different levels of efficacy. Uh, silver leaf whitefly is a, a vector for tomato yellow leaf curl virus. And then aphids, all sorts of aphids, uh, can be vectors of uh, various potiviruses. We also need to think about managing not only the pests, but the pesticides sustainably within the greenhouse. One reason for this uh, when working with insecticides in the greenhouse is that you're in an enclosed airspace. And we need to think about your safety, the safety of your family, and the safety of the people working for you. We also need to think about resistance management because we're going to have extended seasons, many generations of these pests, there's an opportunity for them to develop resistance. The last thing is, is an opportunity within the, uh, the high tunnel, and it's an opportunity for biological control. It's a controlled environment. We can release things in there. They're contained in there. They have to feed on the pests that are in there. Our best examples, I know in this slide I say some of our best examples, but really our best examples of biocontrol are in greenhouses. High tunnel insecticides. When it comes to using insecticides in the high tunnel or the greenhouse, both those are considered greenhouses. 
So when a pesticide label says that something is prohibited in the greenhouse, that chemical is also prohibited in the high tunnel. Uh, so the EPA considers high tunnels synonymous with, with greenhouses. Again, because it is an enclosed airspace, uh, there's potentially a higher risk to applicators and workers. You need to be very mindful of that. Some of our field pesticides are prohibited. So just because it says tomatoes on the label, you also need to look on the label to see if greenhouses are prohibited. So not all tomato insecticides would be permissible for use on tomatoes in the greenhouse. You need to watch your restricted entry intervals and your pre-harvest intervals. Those are the REIs and PHIs very carefully. And because there's a higher risk to applicators, you need to use your personal protective equipment, your PPEs. So, uh, you know, the federal government likes using these acronyms, but you have to know what your REIs, PHIs, and PPEs are for all the chemicals that you're using. The other thing is that because we're dealing with season extension, we can actually be working on a particular crop in the greenhouse for a number of months. Uh, the, probably the longest example would be indeterminate tomatoes uh, in the greenhouse or in the high tunnel where it can go uh, six months or more. Many of our chemicals give a maximum number of times you can apply these for a particular crop cycle. And some of these are pretty limiting when we have these very long duration crops. And so you, you really need to, to pick and choose carefully when you use these chemicals. We can't use them on a regular schedule. We'll, we'll run out of uh, applications of some of these products. So we use them as necessary. And when we use them, we try and get the, 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 the best possible control we can uh, from them. This list, I don't know if you've seen me uh, use this slide before, but it's changed uh, quite a bit in the last year. Um, there's actually fewer insecticides and miticides that are prohibited in the greenhouse. Uh, companies have chosen to remove some of those prohibitions. And so this list has gotten quite a bit uh, shorter. What it means is that growers have more chemicals available. It gives them more rotation options. But the chemicals on this list cannot be used in the high tunnel or in a greenhouse. And there's one there in blue. I, I just uh, colored the uh, miticides blue. Uh, the rest in black are various insecticides that are prohibited in the, in the high tunnel. All right, well, I, I was just going to touch very quickly on the, the four key groups that we see attacking most of our high tunnel crops. Uh, the first of these are white flies. Uh, white flies are probably what I hear most often from uh, producers and county agents. We have two uh, common species. We have the greenhouse white fly there on the left, and we have the, the silver leaf white fly on the right. White flies are the, they're all about the same size, and when they're flying, they look basically identical. However, when they're settled on the leaf, if you look at those on the left and compare them to the ones on the right, notice the ones on the left hold their wings much flatter. The ones on the right hold their wings more vertically, so you see a space between the wings. This is, this is an important distinction because different insecticides work differently on these two different types of, of white flies. Also, when you look underneath the older leaves and look at some of the nymphs, and here I have some nymphs that are uh, magnified. You can see the greenhouse white fly has a lot of, uh, of it has a fringe of hairs around it, whereas the silver leaf white fly looks basically uh, bald uh, when you look at it with a hand lens. So white flies, when you, when you uh, scout your, 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 your high tunnel, it doesn't matter if you're growing uh, 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 raspberries or strawberries or tomatoes or, or melons, uh, look on the undersides of the leaves, look at some of the older leaves, or at least leaves that are fully expanded. Uh, these white flies can complete their life cycle in less than a month. Uh, one of the key scouting uh, tools is to look on the plant for honeydew. These are sticky substances produced by the white flies. They drip onto the lower leaves and fruit, uh, and they can also contribute to the, the buildup of sooty mold on leaves and, and the fruit and uh, other materials in, in the high tunnel. Uh, keep in mind that the silver leaf white fly can transmit tomato yellow leaf curl virus. 
the silver leaf white fly can also cause some uh, plant abnormalities. If you, if you look at these uh, tomato fruit in the picture, you can see how one half is red and one half is green. And that's from enzymes injected into the plant by the silver leaf white fly. Particular, some, particularly, some of our heirloom varieties are more susceptible to uh, these abnormalities. White fly management. We recommend that you, you monitor plants weekly uh, as you walk through the, the greenhouse. I like tapping some of the stakes and, and uh, trying to dislodge the, uh, the adults to see if they flutter around. Flip over uh, leaves, look on the undersides of the leaves with a hand lens for the uh, yellow to orange looking nymphs. Use yellow sticky cards. I like at least four yellow sticky cards per high tunnel. Place them right at the canopy height of the plant. And biocontrol, we have excellent biocontrol tools for both greenhouse white fly and silver leaf white fly. These are small stingless wasps, but notice that we use one species for one white fly and we use a different species for the other white fly. So identification is very important. In terms of insecticides, uh, we have two different types of insecticides for white flies. We have insect growth regulators that control the nymphs, and we have several choices there. And we have uh, uh, basically poisons for the adults and the nymphs. These are not insect growth regulators. And we do have uh, several different uh, materials there. In this picture, notice that I, I drew some circles around these different products. And products within the same circle kill white flies in the same way. And so if we want to rotate among products to prevent resistance development, you need to jump between those circles of products. Uh, I recommend that on a monthly basis, you rotate the, the, the types of mode of action of your insecticides you're using against white flies. The second major group of insects attacking uh, high tunnel plants are thrips. Uh, we have uh, uh, several different species of thrips. Uh, they can cause direct damage. H here you can see on that tomato the gold flecking that you get with the feeding damage on the surface of the tomato. Uh, just as important is that they're vectors of tomato spotted wilt virus. And so they, they uh, will move that virus around uh, from the outside of the high tunnel, inside the high tunnel and between plants. When you uh, are scouting for insects within your high tunnel, these are the characteristic signs we see in the high tunnel. They tend to be up on the uh, surface of leaves. They cause some silver spotting. And then you're going to see those tar spots that are around those silver spots. Uh, it looks very similar to some diseases where you have uh, off-colored spots with, with uh, uh, sometimes pycnidia in there. One thing that's a little different is you'll notice some of these tar spots outside the feeding area, outside those silver zones on, on the plant. Thrips have two protected stages in the life cycle that we cannot control with insecticides. So the eggs are laid inside the tissue. We don't have anything that kills eggs and we don't have anything to uh, go after them in that tissue. Uh, as the eggs emerge, you have the uh, larval stages on the leaves. These are susceptible to our sprays. But after the second instar larva, they move down into the media. So they go underground. And at that point, they're no longer susceptible to our sprays. And after the pupil stage, they emerge as adults. Again, they're exposed. We can control them. So you see it's the first and second instar larva and the adults that we can control with our sprays. One reason why this is important is, is that people may spray with something that has fairly short residual. Uh, and five days later, they notice a lot of adults out there. They notice a lot of small nymphs again. And the reason is the populations have cycled through. More eggs have hatched. More pupae have, have uh, changed into adults coming out of the so soil. And so sometimes with some of our sprays, you may have to make multiple applications uh, at five to seven day intervals to, to control the entire population as they cycle through. Uh, th thrips do plants uh, pierce plant cells when they feed. They're pier piercing sucking. Uh, they're mainly females. They, they can be uh, as high as 70% females in, in the high tunnel, which means that uh, they're producing an awful lot of eggs. They have a tremendous capacity for increasing in numbers. Uh, they can complete their life cycle in 5 to 14 days, depending upon the species. We do use uh, yellow 
or blue sticky cards, I actually recommend the yellow sticky cards. Again, places just above the canopy height, you're going to be monitoring not only white flies, but thrips and aphids as well. Uh, the other tool I like using is uh, uh, tapping buds or flower clusters over a white sheet of paper and, and looking for the, the minute thrips running around on, on that uh, paper. I recommend people that work and uh, go into and out of uh, high tunnels and greenhouses do not wear bright colored clothing. Thrips will be attracted to a yellow t-shirt as you're outdoors. When you walk into the high tunnel, you may bring some of those thrips uh, on your clothing. Just, just a little bit more about them as vectors. Uh, they, they acquire the, the uh, virus when they're immatures. And once they acquire it and become adults, they transmit it for the rest of their lives. So they, they are what we call persistent vectors of these viruses. Uh, we do have a few insecticides. This is one of these pest groups where we don't have a lot of insecticides, but we do have a few. And you need to use these pesticides very judiciously uh, so you have them available when you need them. But we do have some pyrethroids like Brigade and Baythroid. We have Agrimec. That's uh, a different chemical class. A sale and Venom would be in a different chemical class. And then Pylon would be in its own class. Uh, retreatment may be needed with some of these products. Just I wanted to go over aphids very quickly. Aphids are very common, but uh, generally they're, they're pretty easy to deal with in the, in the high tunnel. We have multiple species. We have green peach aphid, cotton aphid, melon aphid, tobacco aphid. They come in different colors, anything from minute and yellow to uh, large and red. Uh, there is some insecticide resistance with some of our aphid species. Uh, they do remove sap, and they're going to make honeydew just like the uh, white flies. They cause leaf curling, and a lot of times you see some cupping downward with uh, uh, aphid problems a very high reproductive rate. And one reason for that is in the greenhouse, most of the aphids, if not all the aphids, are going to be females. And they do not need to mate to produce more females. And so when a, a live female is born, she already has her daughters developing within her. And so their uh, life cycles can be completed in as little as uh, uh, five to six days. And they do transmit uh, viruses on, the, on their mouth parts. So, if, if you look at the aphids in this picture, it's, it's hard to imagine that all those are females. There, there are no males in that picture. Uh, so in terms of aphid management, sanitation is very important. Good, good weed control. Always inspect plants when they come into the greenhouse. Manage your nitrogen levels. If you use excessive nitrogen rates, this actually increases the reproductive rate of the aphids. So moderate nitrogen levels are needed. Again, yellow sticky cards, biocontrol is an option. We have lady beetles, lace wings, and parasitic wasps that can, that can be used. In terms of insecticides, we do have systemics and we do have contact sprays. Uh, the only thing I'd, I'd warn you with the systemics is some of those can have very long pre-harvest intervals, uh, as many as uh, uh, 21 to uh, 30 days with some of those products. Mites, I uh, just wanted to say a few things about mites. Uh, the, the high tunnel is an ideal situation for mites. Uh, we have the two-spotted spider mite causing stippling. Uh, they produce webbing. Uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, or strawberries are some of our most susceptible crops. Uh, again, very short life cycle, very high reproductive rate. When, you, when you're scouting, look for stippling on the leaves. These little tiny uh, pinpoint white spots on the leaves are, are characteristic of, of mite damage. In terms of mite management, weed control, both in the greenhouse and outside the, the, the greenhouse and high tunnel. I would like to see a zone of, of 20 or 25 feet around the high tunnel that's weed free, you know, a, a gravel pad around that, that high tunnel is ideal. That's going to limit weed uh, growth in that area, and uh, uh, it's going to slow the uh, colonization of the high tunnel with, with some of these insect pests. Uh, uh, monitor plants weekly. Uh, tap leaves over a white piece of paper to enable uh, uh, being able to see some of these mites. And again, uh, some of our, 
are very soft insecticides like the horticultural oils and insecticidal soaps are very, very effective when we have light populations of mites if, if we can get good, good coverage. But when we start to see uh, serious infestations, we need to use some of the other materials like Agrimec, Canamite, Acromite, even Oberon is now available in the uh, high tunnel. This is one pest we hadn't seen until uh, four or five years ago. I uh, hadn't seen that at all in Kentucky, and, and now it's one of our more common problems in, in the high tunnel. This is the tomato russet mite. It's uh, even among mites, this is minute. This is a very, very small mite, uh, not much larger than the plant hairs itself. Uh, it starts at the bottom of plants and it works upward. Uh, producers may uh, indicate that the, the plants look like they've been burned up or fired up from the bottom. It sounds like a disease, but this is actually a mite problem. Uh, they they, bur they uh, eat their way up the plant and they're, they're found on the green limbs, uh, uh, leaves, I'm sorry. Uh, stems with this uh, mite will turn bronze. So this is characteristic of tomato russet mite damage in a, a tomato high tunnel. And you can see how the, the bottom of the plant just looks fired up. And you can also see the fruit from the middle of that plant looks russeted. And that's where the uh, tomato russet mite gets its name. Uh, here's another uh, photo of just showing the russeting that you can get on the fruit. Uh, tomato russet mite, very short life cycle, five to six days. They feed only on solanaceous plants and weeds. Uh, they can be moved by people on your clothing, wind within the high tunnel, even equipment. So they, they move very quickly. Uh, scout for damage and confirm it with a, a 20x or stronger hand lens. Uh, we only have two products in the greenhouse that we can use for russet mite control, Agrimec and Oberon. So uh, just to summarize this, with, with insect monitoring, uh, you need to be able to recognize these common groups of insects in the high tunnel. If it's not one of these pests, take it to your county extension office and have your uh, local agent help you identify the problem. We need to be monitoring the plants in the greenhouse on a weekly basis at a minimum. Twice a week would even be better. Uh, after you spray, you need to go back in there and evaluate how well your control was. Uh, do this after the REI has expired for, for your own safety. You need to keep records. This is probably the, uh, the, one of the more important things. It's not, it's not important just to scout, but you have to write down what you observe during scouting. So I have an example here. This would be an example uh, monitoring form. Then this would be used at least once a week. You would have a map of your high tunnel. Uh, locations where, where you uh, made your observations and there would be spaces in there for, for what you're finding on that uh, scouting trip. Why is writing down the information important? Because uh, to know that you have mites is important, but what is even more important is, is your mite population going up? Is it staying the same or is it going down? The, and that's what you can determine when you begin to write down what, what you observe on your monitoring visits. Just uh, in terms of management, we have uh, uh, inspection of new plants. Uh, we like to start the high tunnel empty before you start a new crop cycle. So in the winter, you would open up your high tunnel and let it freeze out. In the summer, you close it up and you let it burn out uh, prior to starting that new crop. Uh, sanitation, you know, plant-free periods, uh, a weed-free high tunnel. Uh, disposal and roguing of heavily infested plants in a plant-free zone around the high tunnel. Monitoring, everyone should be using yellow sticky cards. Uh, regular plant inspection, if you've had fungus gnat problems, we can actually use uh, cut potato pieces to monitor for them. In terms of environmental management, watch your fertility. Excessive nitrogen levels can contribute to insect problems. Watch your water management, watch your temp temperature. Uh, think about using biological control. If you have recurrent pest problems, we have biological control options for you to, to bring these problems under control. In terms of uh, pesticide management, uh, there are preventive sprays, things like insecticidal soap and neem applications that, that are uh, uh, used preventively. Then many of our other insecticides are used after we see that we have a problem. 
Think about the method of application. Uh, systemic applications are going to have very long pre-harvest intervals. Foliar applications with the same materials will go, uh, uh, you'll pass that, that uh, pre-harvest interval much faster. And think about resistance management. Uh, these pests can develop uh, resistance to products that are overused in the high tunnel. Think about good cultural practices. Sloppy greenhouses will have recurrent insect problems that are very difficult to control. So we really need to be using good cultural practices. We don't want standing water in the high tunnel. We don't want weed problems inside or outside our high tunnel. These are only going to contribute to insect and, and I'm confident to say even disease problems when, when, when we're sloppy. So uh, when it comes to developing a plan for your high tunnel, uh, your plan is only as solid as, as the pieces that, that make up the plan. So with that. Great. Thank you, Rick. I think we'll see if Sean can get um, connected to us. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Hi, Sean, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, weed management in high tunnels is primarily about prevention, sanitation, cultural control. Herbicides may be used in the year or years prior to tunnel construction to reduce the amount of weeds present in the area, but they're not used once the tunnel is constructed. Uh, with a slight caveat in that, I will say that tunnels are not greenhouses for uh, tax purposes in that. They are considered temporary structures, and I'm sure it was mentioned earlier that as you're fertilizing your tunnels, your crops and your tunnels, eventually your fertilizers, your salts build up in your soils and you need to think about removing the plastic from your tunnels in order to allow some of those salts to leach from your soils. Uh, so there is that brief window of time when you do remove the plastic from your tunnel, when it's no longer in production, that uh, you might be able to go in and use a contact herbicide or something if you needed to to clean up any weeds or things but that's not really a normal practice per se it's really more about prevention and sanitation up front uh, so you want to keep that in mind in terms of weeds I want to talk a little bit about why weeds are even an issue we've heard from Dr. Besson about how weeds can harbor insects and lead to further problems. But weeds in and of themselves can cause problems by certain characteristics that they have. Uh, weeds are very prolific. Uh, they've developed to take advantage of various resources such as space, light, water, nutrients to the detriment of the crop that we're trying to go. And uh, the high reproductive output that's shown here on this slide indicates how prolific some weeds can be. This was from a study done in 1932, an estimate of weed production per plant and things. As you can see, if even only 1% of the seeds that were produced from these weed plants were allowed to germinate the following year, a tremendous weed population could develop, uh, whether it's in your field or in your high tunnel. So. Uh, high reproductive output is one of the characteristics that weeds are known for. Weeds also tend to be very persistent. Uh, there have been many buried weed seed studies where scientists will take weed seeds and bury them in various conditions and various crops, various types of weeds, and examine the germination of those weeds over time and things. One of the first weed germination studies was done back in 1879 in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Beal buried weeds of 20 different species and over time these weeds were retrieved and encouraged to germinate. Uh, here's some data that looks at just persistence of various weed seed species. Uh, 80 years, 100 years for mullein. Not all weeds certainly persist that long. Uh, the persistence of the weeds is a characteristic of the seed coat, the uh, stored reserves in the seeds, the germination inhibitors that are present in the seed, environmental conditions and things such as that. But you can see 
just as an estimate from this why gardeners say that one year's worth of seeding can lead to seven years worth of weeding because weeds are very persistent. Um, keep that in mind as well. That's one of the reasons why you want to take care of weeds before they go to seed so that they don't develop into these long-term problems. Weed identification is critical as well in weed management. Uh, I try and avoid saying weed control as much as possible because you don't really control weeds so much as you manage them. Uh, in a high tunnel situation, hopefully you're going to follow good practices before you develop your planting site so that they don't develop into issues. But I think every grower should have uh, a couple of good weed identification resources around. These are two of my favorite ones. Uh, in terms of hard publication, Weeds of the Northeast or Weeds of the North Central States. Uh, weeds of the Northeast, I know you can find that online. Uh, weeds of the North Central States is a little bit more difficult to find. Depending upon where you're located, if, I know we do have some people that have uh, possibly joined us from other states, but even here in Kentucky, uh, this Weeds of the Northeast book is very good. It will enable you to identify many of the weeds that we will see here in Kentucky. Uh, there's also a link there at the bottom to the Weed Science Society of America that has some good weed identification pages. Kind of keep that in mind. Within the last couple weeks, Ohio State University has just released an iBook as well. It is free. I haven't downloaded it and uh, looked at it myself. I don't have uh, an Apple product to look at that publication on as well, but it's called the Ohio State Guide to Weed Identification, and I can provide a link to that uh, in the chat box here at the end of my presentation if somebody wants to check that out. I've heard it's very good. If somebody has a uh, favorite app or something that they like, uh, certainly would like to hear about that as well. I only have one application on my iPhone and it's simply for a uh, flashlight app. I need to develop more of these resources as well myself. But uh, if you have something good that's out there that you like to use, uh, certainly let the other participants know. But uh, Weeds in the Northeast is one of my favorite publications out there. Has some very nice pictures, helps you identify alternatives as well. Most people now are walking around with a cell phone as well that has a camera on it. Uh, so you can always shoot some pictures of a weed that you don't recognize and email that off to your county agent or email it to me uh, with the quality of the cameras we're getting now on our cell phones. It's becoming much easier to identify weeds and things just from a picture. We no longer have to wait to send weeds through the postal service or things like that anymore. Steps to weed management, uh, one of the most critical things that people need to think about is preparing your site prior con to construction, uh, particularly if you know that you have perennial weeds that are an issue, uh, Johnson grass, Canada thistle, things like that, that are difficult. Perennial weeds are those weeds that have overwintering structures that allow them to persist uh, through severe environmental conditions or just through a winter period or um, something like that. You know, they either have large storage roots, they have nutlets, they have tubers, they have rhizomes. Unlike an annual weed, which goes from germination to flowering to seed set to death in a single growing season, whether it's a spring to fall for a summer annual or a fall to a spring for a winter annual, uh, those perennial weeds are things that you really need to get under control. Because even if you mow them off and then put your tunnel down, uh, the buds that are on those overwintering structures or the nutlets or the tubers can re-germinate and then sprout back up in your high tunnel. So you really need to get those perennial weeds under control prior to establishing your site. Uh, also look up wind and see what might be blown towards your tunnel or if you have uh, waterways upstream from your tunnel that might be flooding in the spring if you get a lot of uh, rain or snow melt or something you need to be aware of what might be coming your way 
Um, certainly encourage people to have a diversity of flora on their farms. I'm a beekeeper and I like to see people have a diversity of wildflowers and things around for our native pollinators. But you don't want them upwind of your tunnels. Downwind is where you would want them uh, so that they're not blown into your tunnel. You also have to be very careful of what you bring into your tunnel. Don't bring in problems uh, trying to improve your tunnel. I know many people do like to add uh, manures to their soils to amend their soils. If they're not using cover crops to build up organic matter, manure is a common way to add organic matter to soils. But there have been studies where graduate students have gone through and extracted weed seed from various manure uh, systems uh, that have been produced in different ways, whether it's been composted or whether it's raw manure, uh, fresh manures, things that have passed through different types of animals, uh, different weed species. If you ever have concerns about the type of job that you have, you can imagine the poor graduate students that had to extract them weed seeds from the newer manure. But it was very interesting because many of those studies show that grass weeds particularly tend to have softer seed coats than broad-leaved weeds, uh, so they don't survive passage through livestock as well. And animals like chicken or poultry that have gizzards where seeds are ground up inside, uh, they will also be broken down quicker, uh, whereas weed seeds that pass through cows or horses or things like that and are excreted in the manure, they tend not to be broken down as much. So you want to make sure that you're not bringing in problems into your tunnel. Also, if you want to use uh, straw, make sure it's nice, clean, weed-free straw that you bring into your tunnel. Too often, people will just purchase cheap hay that they can get inexpensively somewhere and bring it in as a mulch for in their tunnel. But they're also bringing in weed problems when they do that as well. So keep that in mind. Follow good sanitation practices. Don't bring in problems. And timeliness is critical as well to weed management. If your weeds get too big, they're going to be competing with your crop plants for light, for moisture, for nutrients, for space. Deal with them when they're small and they're easy to eliminate. Often if a weed gets too big, people are tempted to pull it out of the soil then. But that can disturb the root system of your crop plant. You're better off cutting it off at the ground below the where the cotyledons would be on the plant uh, so that it doesn't re-sprout. So you kind of got to keep those things in mind. Uh, sanitation and timeliness are critical in dealing with weed management. A well-designed high tunnel is very good. Dr. Besson mentioned earlier leaving a gravel pad around your tunnel. I uh, want to thank Dr. Saha for this photograph here. Uh, this is a high tunnel research center at the Southwest Purdue Ag Center in Vincennes. You can see there's a nice weed-free gravel pad around that. Underneath the gravel there is landscape fabric, so any weeds that do blow in, any seeds that blow in that tend to fall down through that gravel and want to germinate, there is still a barrier to prevent them from rooting into the soil so that they can be dealt with quickly that way. Uh, so it's easy. It does add to the cost of construction, and I'm aware of that. But in the long term, it will pay for itself in terms of better crop growth, uh, better site management. You'll have less problems with insects. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Siebold will mention about the importance of maintaining good airflow through tunnels. By eliminating weeds from around your tunnel, you have better airflow, which will also cut down on the amount of uh, disease problems that you will have as well. So think about these things at the outset if you haven't put your tunnel down yet, and think about doing that as well. Uh, this is just an interior shot of one of those tunnels. Depending upon the type of cropping system that you're using, uh, you can also use landscape fabric inside the tunnel, cut holes, burn holes through the fabric and plant through them. Uh, that will also prevent soil from splashing up on your plants, helping with the disease control issues. In this case, the white fabric between the rows is laying on top of landscape fabric as well. 
and just helps to increase the light reflectance in the tunnel to improve growth of the crop plants in there. Uh, I know many people don't use landscape fabric in their tunnels because of their cropping system, uh, but it certainly is an option. Uh, the use of some type of mulch, as I mentioned earlier, can be done, but make sure that it's a nice, clean, weed-free straw, or you could use shredded newspaper or something like that that's not going to bring in any type of weed seeds. Finally, if you do have your tunnel up, things to think about are cultural control methods. Um, solarization can be used in late winter. In this process, the soil is warmed prior to planting the crop to encourage weed germination. Once the weeds germinate, you open up the tunnel, allow cold air to come in and kill off whatever has germinated. Uh, this eliminates any of those weeds that are in that prime germination zone in the shallow portion of the soil. And then when you go in and plant your crop plant, you don't till the soil deeply to bring up more weed seeds. You just do shallow cultivation, shallow soil management to plant your crops into that soil into a stale seed bed where there aren't as many weed seeds present. Uh, but certainly if you've done a good job preparing your tunnel beforehand, you shouldn't have too many weed seeds in your soil. Heating the tunnel can also be done in uh, late July, early August here in Kentucky when it's hot. And this will certainly help kill some of the weed seed that's in the soil. Uh, one thing I do like to remind people if they're going to do that though is to remove any planting trays or things that they keep in their tunnels, uh, clean them out as much as possible because those high temperatures that can build up in the tunnels can uh, be very hard on your plastic tubing, your uh, potting trays and those sorts of things. So just clean out your tunnel. Closing up the tunnel is a very good way to help control insects as Dr. Besson mentioned, uh, weeds or diseases as well, I'm sure as Dr. Siebold will mention, so those are certainly good methods. Proper watering and fertilization are very good means for controlling weeds in high tunnels and in the field. Uh, don't over fertilize. Weeds are very good at examine, at exploring and finding nutrients, uh, finding water in limited areas and things. That's one thing that makes weeds very good at what they do. They're very efficient users of limited moisture, limited nutrients. Uh, many of them have very fine root systems and things. That was some of my graduate work at North Carolina State was dissecting root systems of weeds and comparing it to soybeans and things. And uh, the weeds that I was looking at had tremendous root systems compared to the uh, soybean crop. So put down what you need. Uh, too much can be as bad as too little. Uh, just carefully monitor what you're doing. Uh, crop rotation is very important, uh, not only in terms of disease management, insect management, but also just by following different crop rotation systems. You'll be planting different crops at different times. That prevents any selection for summer annual weeds versus winter annual weeds and things like that. Not quite as important in a high tunnel as it is in the field, but it's certainly something to think about always like people to be thinking about crop rotation as well. Uh, lastly, cultivation, uh, cutting off of weeds, those are very important as well. But as I mentioned, these perennial weeds do have means to survive uh, being cut off because they have structures underneath ground that will allow them to re-sprout from dormant buds and things. So I can't overemphasize the importance of Getting your site clean before you put up your tunnel. Don't let problems develop. Follow good sanitation practices. Uh, and don't bring in problems into your tunnel. Uh, I'll be around in that. And uh, I will now turn it back to the folks in Lexington. Thank you, Sean. I'll go on and get started, Kenny. All right. So lastly, but not leastly, we're going to talk a little bit about managing diseases in, in these high high tunnel uh, grown vegetable crops and and what I'm going to focus the time on is are some tactics that we can use just general tactics that we can use to cover most of our major disease problems and we'll also talk about you know cultural practices we'll talk about um, chemical use in there as well so let's stop and take a real quick look at high tunnels and what kind of risk they pose in terms of disease 
you know, one of the things that that, um, that I hear folks saying sometimes with a high tunnel is, hey, I want to grow in a high tunnel because I've heard that there's less risk, to there's less problems with disease, there's less of a risk. And, and really, a more true statement would be that you're trading off risk. It's true that you have less problems with diseases that are very common to see in field-grown vegetables because you don't have the splashing rain and things like that. Like it says here at the top, you got a lower risk for diseases that are favored by rain. But what we do see is a trade-off. When you get that high tunnel environment, especially where you have issues with ventilation, we tend to see more problems with things that we would hardly ever see in the field. So basically high humidity, low, you know, poor ventilation type diseases like powdery mildew or botrytis, things like that. So those are some things to think about. And when we talk about disease risk in these tunnels, um, one of the things that we, or some of the things that we think about are things like the fact that these plants will share the same space, sometimes in very tight quarters, which can lead to easy plant to plant spread. Let me see if I can get my pointer to work here. Here we go. The other thing that you run into sometimes is the inability to ventilate adequately in some of these structures. And more importantly, down at the bottom, you have a potential for buildup and carryover of pathogens. And there's some reasons behind this. The pathogens could be there already. The pathogens could come in on soil that you brought in, or they could come in on plants that are brought in. And then the other thing that we see a lot with high tunnels is a lack of diversity in terms of rotations, which you get to the same crops grown over and over again, sometimes twice a year, but over multiple seasons, and that poor rotation can lead to a higher disease risk. Little green arrow stayed there. Yeah, cool. I can pick it right back up. That's awesome. So when we think about managing managing uh, diseases in a high tunnel, you actually have some some things going for you that you can kind of control that you can't control in an outside situation. You know, you, you definitely you're, you you don't have rainfall issues like you would see out of doors, and so you can you can really focus on a, an integrated strategy where you're trying to keep your plants healthy by planting disease resistant varieties. You're trying to reduce pathogen activity, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then you can also manipulate the environment a lot more. I would say a lot more extensively than you could outside to make that environment less friendly for pathogens. So let's take a closer look then. So one of the big things that we look at, this is critical, I think, in terms of managing diseases in a high tunnel is sanitation because it has a huge impact on the diseases you're going to see. What you're really trying to do is to keep those organisms from carrying over from year to year. You're trying to prevent them from being introduced to. So think about this, this in terms of when you start. You want to, before you plant, try to remove any plant debris and weeds that are inside the tunnel. The other thing that you want to do is sanitize the surfaces of the tunnel itself, the planting materials, the tools, and the equipment that you will use in the tunnel. There are different things that you can use, but uh, generally speaking, things like a 10% bleach solution that I list here, some ammonia solutions, and some peroxides, those can be things that can be used to sanitize the surfaces inside your tunnel to help knock back things that might already be there. The other thing, and I won't, I won't dwell on this but because Dr. Wright covered this quite extensively, but you do want to maintain a weed-free buffer around the tunnel. It's a harborage for insects, it's a harborage for pathogens, and it blocks airflow. And that's going to be one of the critical points that we try to drive home here is that airflow is everything in the tunnel in terms of disease control. The other thing that we look at, and, and, and this is essentially sanitary practices that we would carry out during the course of the growing season. These, these are things that ways for us to get rid of disease material and also get rid of material that might be, might be more susceptible to pathogen invasion. So you want to get rid of diseased or damaged plants, foliage, and, and fruit. And that's what's being illustrated over here on the right-hand side of this picture. This is, this is a greenhouse uh, picture that I took a couple years ago where the grower had a really serious problem with something called leaf mold. That's what's causing these yellow spots on top of the leaf. And it's a, it's a humidity-dependent disease, and their solution was to go through and remove all the diseased foliage to open up the canopy, improve airflow, reduce the potential for disease, and also remove that diseased tissue so it couldn't cycle over and over again. So what you get here, you slow the spread of disease because you're taking out the pathogen source, you're removing the host for the pathogens. To make this work, what you got to do, you can't wait till you have a serious, serious disease problem and then try to go through and prune everything out because it can it wind up being too late to really handle it. What you want to do is get ahead of it and catch it when it's early. The way to do this is to check that tunnel two to three times per week, more if you've got the time, looking for problems. And then when you get rid of that disease material, I have seen people go through the process of, of pruning and doing things like this, and then they discard that between the rows. It's not what you want to do because that's going to then be a harborage for certain types of pathogens that will then get back onto the crop. You want to take that, this, that dead plant material, either bury it, or you can take it and discard it at least 100 yards from the tunnel so that it doesn't blow back in. All right. Other things. Yeah, during the growing season, keeping the structure tidy is important and weed-free. Wash your hands regularly. Try not to use tobacco products. 
in, in, in a greenhouse because there are, if you're growing tomatoes, there are some things that can, viruses that can carry over in, especially chewing tobacco that could infect your, your crop. Avoid handling the plants when the foliage is wet so you don't, so you don't run the risk of spreading disease. And then at the end of the season, start thinking about that next cropping cycle. What you want to do in end of the season or between the crops is remove all the plant debris and any weeds that might be inside the structure, and this includes the roots. The roots can be a, a basically a, a way that certain types of root pathogens and things like nematodes that what they can carry over like that. And then another option might be to kind of finalize and clean things up. You can solarize the tunnel. So let's talk real quickly about what that means. So far, solarizing high tunnels. Simple way to do that, and, and Sean Wright kind of alluded to this, is to close that structure tightly for two to three weeks in the heat of the summer. Close it up and let it get really, really hot on the inside. And that's going to sterilize things to, to a certain degree, kill things on the soil surface. These high temperatures are going to cut back on pathogens, going to cut back on weeds and insects. You can also go in inside that tunnel itself and cover the soil with clear plastic to increase the effect that you might see on soil-borne pathogens. So what you want to do is moisten the soil beforehand, remove all the root material like I mentioned, and, and, and work the soil up and cover it with clear plastic and you'll get a, a sort of a sanitizing effect, say in that upper two to three inches of soil. The ideal time frame to do this in Kentucky would be July through August. And be careful when you, when you close that structure up. Here I mentioned two to three weeks. If you go much longer than that, it can be detrimental to the plastic. The high temperatures can actually break down your plastic and you may find yourself changing that cover, your high tunnel, more often than you'd like. Next thing we look at is, is limiting the ability of pathogens to survive and carry over in the, in the high tunnel. And crop rotation is a good way to do this, is what we do outside in the field. Problem that we run into in high tunnels is it may not be an option for many growers. And, and, and part of this has to do with the fact that you can't really, you know, there's a limited number of crops you can rotate to that are profitable. You know, high tunnels are pretty, pretty expensive type structures. You know, you, you know you have, you've got a lot invested in them and you've got to get a quick return on things. But in as much as you can, try to rotate things around it, you know, use the, you know, switch things up, you know, between cropping cycles if you can by growing different plant families. Because one thing that we know is if you continuously plant related crops in the tunnel, eventually you lead to problems. And that's what's illustrated down here at the bottom. I've got two things here. These are, these are problems that we've seen on tomatoes in high tunnels in Kentucky over the last couple of years. This one on the left hand side is bacterial wilt of tomato, something we hardly ever see in the field but we have seen in high tunnels because it gets in and then you have this protected environment that allows it to thrive. The other thing that we see for, that is becoming an increasing problem in Kentucky is root knot nematode. We don't have a serious nematode problem in field grown crops in Kentucky and vegetable crops, but in high tunnels, again, because of the protected environment, these things can move in and they can become very problematic. And once they become established to the point where you see symptoms, it's going to be really hard to get rid of them. So once you run into these issues, the options to deal with this would be to rotate to things that aren't susceptible. Um, the other option would be to move the tunnel, change the site. The other option might be to grow hydroponically. And we've had some folks do this, re refit the, the, the high tunnel so that you can use a, 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 a perlite bag type system to get away from those soil pathogens and then solarize in the soil. But something has to be done to address those or you won't be able to grow very effectively. Other things we can do to keep pathogens out, some simple steps. You know, don't locate your high tunnel where vegetables and tobacco were grown. And here I'm thinking about things that would carry over in the soil that might affect the crop. Don't locate the tunnel very close to vegetable fields that are planted or, or tobacco fields because there are things that will, that will move in and, and affect the crop. And by, by close, I mean, you know, staying at least 50 yards away from those types of sites will really help you out. Controlling your insects and weeds, as this gentleman before me mentioned, because they're presential sources of plant pathogens. Insects and weeds can cause these issues. As far as irrigation, you know, not many folks do this, but you don't want to use water from ponds and creeks to irrigate because they can carry things like pythium, which is a root pathogen that can be really difficult to deal with. And try to use pathogen-free plant material, whether that's transplants or seeds, you want to use those things so you don't in introduce these problems into the tunnel environment. Another thing to look at, resistant vegetable varieties can be really helpful for some of the common problems we see, like here, here I'm illustrating powdery mildew on cucumber. But there are resistant varieties available to deal with some problems that we run across in high tunnels. Very effective, very inexpensive form can really help you reduce the need for chemicals down the road. Maybe even eliminate the need for chemicals. So look for the best possible disease packaging you can get on the things you grow in the tunnel. And then the other thing that we want to do is think, look at the high tunnel environment. And what we want to do is try to make that less favorable to pathogens. And when we, and when we think about this, what do most plant pathogens like? 
They tend to like moderate to warm temperatures. Some like cool, but generally moderate to warm temperatures. And they like high humidity, whether that's whether that's free moisture on the leaf or just high relative humidity for powdery mildew. Or the other thing that we would look at would be highly saturated soils that might favor certain, you know, certain root infecting pathogens. So you try to keep the relative humidity as low as possible. Try to avoid tight plant spacing so that you can, because generally speaking, if you, especially when you run into humid periods, if you can at least ventilate effectively, you can mitigate the effects of, of, the, of the high humidity. And along those lines, providing good ventilation and airflow can be pretty, pretty helpful as well. When you, it, one of the things that we see with high tunnel producers where you really run into issues with moisture is when we have sunny days, and, and, and you know, it's, it's a cool time of year, but we have sunny days where you get condensation that builds up inside the tunnel at night, collects on the roof, and then rains back down and sprinkles back down on the plants, and that can lead to, to disease issues. And one thing you can do is to try to reduce the amount of humid air that, that builds up in that green or that high tunnel during the course of the day. And the way you would accomplish that is to flush out the humid air early in the morning and late in the afternoon to cut back on the dew formation. The other thing that you can do, and Sean talked about this too, is mulch in between the rows to block, to block the moisture. Another thing that, to, to, that I didn't put on this list that can help too in terms of soil saturation is to use a raised bed. A plastic covered raised bed can really help that as well. As far as irrigation goes, try to do as best as you can to use trickle irrigation because that will water the plants and you won't get as much soil moisture built up. Uh, you want to avoid the saturation of soils and one of the things that I'll see from time to time even where people use trickle irrigation is if you've got uh, the high tunnel located in a place where water might, especially when it rains, might run in pond or build up in the tunnel can cause some issues. So what you want to try to do is ditch around that tunnel to avoid that water ponding and standing in the tunnel because that will lead to disease problems, probably insect problems as well. My entomologist friend, you can't see him, but he's nodding right now. So he's with me. I didn't, I didn't make that up. So, so here we go. So I wanted to get back to, to a point that I made in that previous slide about avoiding plant, tight plant spacing. So I've shown this picture in county meetings before, but you know, I'll just ask you, you can, you can weigh in there on the, on the chat pod if you want to, but you think there are too many plants in this greenhouse. This is a high tunnel. Are there too many plants in here? Everywhere there's a stake, there's a plant. And, and, and the rows are spaced about 18 to maybe 24 inches apart. And what you see there, there's a lot of green and there's some brown. The green is weeds in the tunnel. All the tomatoes that were being grown died from leaf mold because the plant spacing was so tight that the air, you can see they had the sides rolled up in the structure, but the air couldn't move through. Humidity built up that led to a disease problem that, that let that disease move rapidly. And it also hurt these folks because they wanted to apply a fungicide. They had things so tightly spaced they couldn't even get in and effectively apply a fungicide. So too many plants can be a, can be a definite burden inside one of these high tunnels. You want to make sure you don't you don't space things too tightly. Spread things out in as much as you can. Last little point that I'll make here. The last thing we'll talk about are using fungicides and bactericides in these high tunnels. And I'll point out that the information that I'm going to talk about is coming from the Vegetable Production Guide ID 36. It's the the 2014-2015 the version. I believe there's a link here you can download that. It's got information on these chemicals, and it also will give you some reference materials that you can use, point you towards some things you can use for disease identification as well. So as a general rule, when we're using things in high tunnels, there's a couple things to think about. Just remember, a product, pesticide product, cannot be used in a tunnel if that label specifically prohibits greenhouse use, greenhouse use. A high tunnel is a greenhouse as far as the EPA is concerned. You can use products in the high tunnel if they specifically label greenhouse use. The, the other situation in which you can use chemicals in, 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 a, in a greenhouse or a high tunnel is that they're labeled for the crop and they don't specifically prohibit greenhouse use. Sometimes we refer to that as the label being silent on greenhouse use. And Kentucky Department of Agriculture, the EPA, say you can use these chemicals as long as they don't specifically prohibit greenhouse use and they're labeled on the crop. These things can be listed. If you've got a copy of the ID36 on page 19, I've tried to do the best that I could before I with the university to, to list all the things that we could use in Kentucky in a greenhouse. So let's take a real quick look at effective chemical use in, in a greenhouse One of the, or, or a high tunnel. One of the things that's pretty important is the timeliness of application. It's critical to be able to, to, to put this stuff out so that you get the maximum effectiveness. So what you want to do is only use these things when conditions favor disease. And typically you want to try to do this before you see symptoms or at the very latest when you first see those symptoms. The longer you wait, the less effective the chemicals are going to be. And then during the time frame when conditions are favorable, and typically in Kentucky that's going to be when we have rainy periods or overcast periods, when it becomes very difficult to dry things down, you can maintain a regular, regular schedule. Say spraying every five to seven days and you just check the label and see what that minimum interval, interval might be.
The thing, that, the thing to think about, the sprays have to cover the foliage completely to be effective. Most of these chemicals are going to work in a protectant fashion, so coverage is critical. Other things to think about, following the label, very, very important. And one of the things you want to do is make sure, going back to what I mentioned previously, that the product is labeled for the crop and you can use it in the greenhouse. The other thing that you want to do is make sure the crop will, or the, the chemical will control the disease you're trying to control. And so what does that mean? That means that you have to properly identify the problem. If you've got experience and you've dealt with these things before, you probably know what the problem is. If you have any doubts or questions at all, the best thing to do is to get a hold of the local cooperative extension office and, and, and talk to them. And they can either come out and make a visit or you can bring a sample into the, the office and we can have that diagnosed and get you an answer so you can know what to apply. Once you begin to, to use these chemicals, use the correct rate. If you go too low, you may not get the control you want. If you go too high, you could injure the plants. You could also cause yourself to have residue problems that might hurt you down the road. Be aware of season limits for the products. Uh, Dr. Besson mentioned this, but some of these things that we're going to grow in a high tunnel, we're going to grow for a very, very long time. And some of the chemicals that are, uh, that are labeled for use in the high tunnel can only be used a limited number of times during the growing season. So pay attention to that. And then the next thing you want to do is observe resistance management guidelines. As far as safety, I think we've talked about this before, but watch the pre-harvest intervals. That's a, that's a residue issue. Make sure inside that tunnel you're wearing protective clothing, gloves, and safety glasses because there is a higher risk of exposure to these chemicals inside the tunnel. You're inside versus outside. Follow the re-entry interval, REI guidelines that you see on the product labels and post warnings on the entrance to the tunnel to let people know when is the, the safe, when can they come in without wearing protective equipment. Okay. Mention resistance management, I'm going to go through this really briefly. Some fungicides that we can use in the field and also in these high tunnels are very specific in the way that they work and you can run into resistance problems if they're not used correctly. The way chemical companies advise you of whether or not there's a resistance risk is through the use of something called a frac code. And you can find this on the product labels. A lot of time you'll see somewhere on that front page of a label or the container it'll say group something something fungicide. So you'll get fungicides, they'll get a code based on how they kill the pathogens. They'll tend to be numbers, they'll tend to be letters, and just remember, if the product has a number versus a letter, there's, there tends to be a resistance risk. So generally speaking, in terms of managing resistance risk, what you don't want to do is mix up two products that have the same code. Because as far as the fungus is concerned, you're using the same product, and that's not good resistance management. Switch groups, numbers, but after one of the two sprays. Remember that products that have numbers tend to have lower seasonal limits, and that could be the amount that you use for season or the number of sprays. And then as far as tank mixes and alternations in your spray program, you can use M-group products. That means multi-site inhibitor, and those would be protectant things like Mancazever copper. Real quickly, last couple things I'll show you. These are, these are some little snapshots of some stuff that I pulled from the ID36 that uh, are, show you some conventional fungicide products that can be used on high total grown vegetables. And I've broken these up into some things that I call general use just for protection. And then at the bottom are things that would be specific use for problems when you've identified a specific type of disease problem. So you'll see a couple things here that stand out, copper and mancazeb. They both have this M code for their frag. They're very broad spectrum. You can see they cover a wide range of diseases. Copper can be used on most vegetables, has a very short pre-harvest interval, and there's really no limit to the number of applications that you can make in the greenhouse. So it's a very useful chemical, very effective for general protection use. Mancazeb kind of falls into that same range, but it has a longer PHI of 5 to 10 days, but depending on your vegetable crop. So I tend to lean on copper for most of my general purpose sprays. For some of the more specific problems that we run into, there are things like Fontellus, Inspire Super, Quadras Top for things like gray mold and powdery mildew, or for downy mildew like the Thanos right down here. So these are things that you could use when you have a specific problem. Those are conventional pesticides. We also have some things that we could use in terms of the organic realm if you're growing organically. So again, split up into general use and specific use. One of the things that comes out at the top of the list is copper. There are certain copper fungicides like Champ, Nordox, Nucop that are OMRI listed and can be used in the greenhouse and they can also be used in organic agriculture. Very consistent performers, short PHI can be used on most vegetables. Other things that can have some effects, Serenade, is a, bi is a biological preparation that you can use on most vegetables that will control these leaf blights. And then we've got Actinovate that you can use as a soil amendment for seedling diseases. For specific use, for powdery mildew, Millstop is a very good product. If you have problems with white mold or timber rot, Contans is something that can be used on cold crops and cucurbits. It's very, very, it can be very effective. Trilogy can be good on leaf blights. And then if you have a nematode problem, Diterra is labeled. So there are options for organic producers. And so 
that's where I'll draw myself to a close. I probably run a little bit longer than I intended to, but we'll open it up at this point to Miranda and questions and answers. Great. Thank you so much, Kenny, and to all three presenters. We really appreciate um, everything you did to be here tonight with us. So we have a few questions here already. Um, for Kenny, what crops might follow each other in your high tunnel rotations? Uh, like an example, tomatoes followed by peppers followed by something else? Well, that's, you know, going back to that rotational scheme, if you're thinking about things that are related to each other, tomatoes and peppers and potatoes and eggplants are all in the solanaceous family. So those would be things that if you were going to do a sequence, you'd probably be better off doing something like, like a solanaceous crop, a tomato or a pepper, and you could come in with some greens, for example. Or you could come in with um, well, cucurbits might be another might be another option would be a better a better choice than doing say tomatoes and peppers you know uh, consecutively because they're in the same family can, and can share problems. Great, thank you. And how about using rainwater? Rainwater, very safe. Very shouldn't, safe. shouldn't be a problem at all. Great, thank you. Let's see, again. we have a couple. How often can you or should you apply copper to prevent powdery mildew? What I would say is, is for, for powdery mildew, one of, the, one of the nice things about it is if you, if you scout for it and you watch for it, you can actually catch it when it very first starts. You don't have to be on a regular schedule to control powdery mildew. What you can do is you can scout them and look at the very lowest, like some of the bottom leaves that are shaded. And when you see those first colonies of powdery mildew, you can make, say, maybe one, two, maybe even three applications of a chemical. Then you can stop. But continue scouting, and if you see it reappear, then you can deal with it at that point. That's what I would recommend versus doing yourself on a regular schedule. Unless you get into a, like a really humid time of the year, particularly when it's cloudy, then you might try to spray once a week as long as those conditions continue. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, what surfaces need to be sanitized in the high tunnel? Maybe everyone can speak to that. Well, you know, honestly, one of the things that, you know, like I said, I didn't have as much time as I, is, is a, I probably should have shown some disease pictures, but there's a disease called leaf mold. And I'll use this as an example. Leaf mold is a, is a burgeoning, emerging serious tomato problem that we're seeing in these high tunnels, particularly ones that have been established for, say, like three to four years. And those spores can, can survive on the plastic, the inner walls of the plastic that cover your, that cover your tunnel. So when I say surfaces, that's what I mean, even spraying the inside of the plastic in Spraying that with a sanitizing solution and then rinsing that off after, say, like five or ten minutes so that it doesn't degrade your plastic. But those would be those types of surfaces. The stakes that you use would be another good example. Any bench materials that you might have in there, potting materials, like pots, you know, any kind of implement, that type of thing. And, and before you do that, you want to make sure you clean all the debris out of the, uh, the high tunnel itself. So that there shouldn't be extra bags and, and uh, boards and, and stakes in there. Uh, get all that out so when you do go in and spray and sanitize these surfaces, everything's exposed. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, the next one I think is for Rick. How effective are beneficial insects in high tunnel systems? They can be uh, very beneficial depending upon the, the pest problem, but uh, we have uh, wasps that have been used for 30 or more years against white flies, so two different species there. We have uh, various beneficial insects that can be used against aphids. Uh, we do have uh, predatory mites that can be used against thrips. Uh, so there are actually uh, fairly extensive uh, uh, natural enemies that can be purchased. We have mul multiple distributors in the country. Uh, in fact, I have a, a pest problem in the UK greenhouse this week that I'm ordering some beneficial insects for. So uh, it's very common and can be very effective. Great. Thank you. Um, Something related to that, what about pollinator use in high tunnels? Uh, yeah, uh, honeybees are not going to work in high tunnels. Uh, so really, uh, if you have a crop that, that needs to be insect pollinated, uh, you need to think about uh, pollinators. Uh, bumblebees are very effective pollinators within the greenhouse. They sell different sizes of bumblebee colonies. There, there, again, there's multiple companies that will sell these. A lot of times we can get by with some of the smaller sizes for the uh, bumblebee colonies. Keep in mind that when you order a bumblebee colony, uh, they will be effective for about four to six weeks in a high tunnel. And so for some of these very long duration crops, you may want to think about uh, 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 replacing the, the colonies after about six weeks. Okay, great. Thank you.
Um, any questions for a crop rotation in the off-season between tomato crops, or should you take off a full season? Um, it were possible to take off a full season, like if you had uh, something else that you could grow in that tunnel that you felt like could be a revenue generator, or if you had multiple tunnels and you could kind of rotate between them, taking off a full season would be great. If you couldn't do that and you, could, you wanted to at least sort of break things up between two crops, I would recommend planting like a mustard type crop because they produce some natural, you know, sort of bio, biological compounds that can sanitize, that, that basically will, will affect some of the organisms that are in the soil. Like they'll call it, they call it a biofumigant. But you can grow that, chop it up, and incorporate it into the into the into the ground, and that material, when it degrades, will kill off some of the pathogens. Not like a chemical would, but it will reduce them. So that could be a possibility. Second choice might be like a grass crop, some kind of grass or something like that. What about using ornamentals, switching from vegetables over to ornamental crops in the greenhouse? Depends, because some of the ornamentals also carry pathogens that will that will still go back to affect your main crop. Depends on what you grow. Okay, great. Thank you. So that's all the questions we have right now. So feel free to continue adding anything if you're. Um, if you have any more questions, we'll be here for another few minutes, uh, but I would like to take a moment to ask you all to uh, fill out our follow-up survey. Just let us know how we did, what you learned from us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate that feedback and we'll use it for future programs on high tunnels um, for all of you guys. So um, yeah, just let us know how that works. I see a few other people are typing here. Um, I guess I'd like to also draw attention to um, Sean was able to post the link to that um, Ohio State University weed guide that he mentioned. So that link is in the chat box if anyone is interested. You might want to um, check that out. Um, so it looks like another question. Can newspaper be used for mulch in an organic system? I would think so. I think it's approved. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it right used for other things in organic system. I believe it yeah. is. You might want to check back on our uh, webinar three. We did a session about organics uh, and organic high tunnel production specifically. I can't remember exactly if he talked about newspapers, but if he didn't mention it, go on and contact Adam Watson. He would be happy to help you and, and answer that question for you. Um, another one uh, from Russell County, how would compost affect things? Compost could be a, a, a very useful addition. I mean, a lot of benefits shown from, you know, from the standpoint of just improving the tilt of the soil, improving the organic matter, but some, and, and certain compost have been shown over time to suppress certain, certain soil organisms. So yeah, this compost could be a very beneficial thing. But you want to make sure that the organic material is properly composted. Definitely. Food, sa <laughs> food safety, right? Yeah. One of your sanitation issues, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thinking about making and sure wanna, everything's clean yep. before you use it. Right, and you want to make sure you don't overdo it because it, you, one of the things, if you if you use too much, like if you composted manure, for example, if you overload, that tends to hold moisture to the point that you can actually start to see problems with diseases because you've held too much moisture. So, you know, amend the soil, but don't don't re replace all the soil in the in that upper two to three inch layer with, with manure, basically. And uh, take regular soil tests. Yes, definitely. Um, one question is, will we do a future version of this on greenhouses? Um, so far, nothing's in the works, but uh, we'll talk about it. Thanks for the suggestion. Um, and is switching from one side one year to the other side the next year an adequate rotation? It can, it can, it's better than not rotating. It's not mm -hmm. the perfect mm -hmm. scenario. Because you know you really you have a limited amount of physical space between one side and the other, but it is better than leaving things in the same spot. So yeah, it will help. Great, thank you. Let's see, we've got a few more folks typing. We'll take a few more questions this evening. Is it best to cleanse the water? Well, I think 
is that one of the questions how to how to treat like if you're yes. using surface water probably filtration and they've got rick sand filters is something that i've seen that you can pump through there are different types of filtration systems i think sand filters tend to be the least expensive and they can be very helpful but are the sand filters going to remove the uh, potential pathogens, the the pythium and, the and th they'll knock them they'll knock them back. They won't completely remove them. But if your only choice was to use surface water, that would probably be a practical thing. Another thing you could do if you had a holding tank, you could treat chlorine. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember one of the things to think about: you, if you treat surface water, if you had a, if, suppose you had a thousand gallon tank and you filled that thing up and you put the amount of, of chlorine that they recommend for sanitizing for, for human pathogens, it probably won't high enough to kill plant pathogens. They may have to go at a little bit of a higher rate and you have to hold the water and allow the chlorine to break down. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on that. I don't know how long it would take, but that could be another solution. And that's also contributing to overall salt load in the soil when, mm -hmm. when you add that, uh, that chlorine treated water as well. So just keep that in, in the mix. Okay. Okay, great. Um, someone has read that planting soybeans between rows of blackberries helps with adding mm -hmm. green manure to the soil. What is your opinion of that within the high tunnel? I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I would think that there could be some benefits from it. I I, I would think so. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you're you're going to get some uh, uh, forming on the soybeans. You're you're going to get some uh, nitri nitrification going yep. on in the soil. You need some organic matter. I so, think, yes. Sean, go ahead. Yeah, my, my concern with that is the impact on airflow within the tunnel and things. Uh, you've got a pretty tight space in there, and then if you're adding in soybeans as well, it could impact just your ability to get within the tunnel and uh, keep an eye okay, on your crop you. and things. That, that would be my concern. Another question is, what about rotating chickens through in the off season? Uh, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd say uh, be careful with that just with the food safety issues. That there's some new uh, guidelines coming through in terms of uh, uh, the amount of period, amount of time you need between having uh, uh, manure uh, on some of these crops and, and some, some of those guidelines are being extended and I, I just worry about the uh, the food safety risk with having uh, li livestock with, within the, uh, the high tunnel. Okay, thank you. Uh, when is the best time of a morning and evening to raise and lower the sides? Going to the year for sure, but if, if we can we can approach it from two ways. If, if, and maybe the question may be pointing back to something that I said about reducing the humidity. In, in that particular case. Essentially, you know, so first thing at, at daybreak or maybe just a little bit after that, you can raise the sides and kind of flush out some of that humid air. And then if, what you would do as far as reducing humidity, as soon as the sun starts to go down, repeat the process so that you don't go into that overnight period with a high humidity load. But um, outside of that, just in terms of heat control, that's just, you know, you, you, you're looking at a target temperature. That you that you want those plants to have, and you know you want to keep those sides down when when it's cold and leave them like that. But when it starts to warm up, and it can be really tricky, can it, Dr. Besson? When we get into that time of year where we're still kind of chilly outside, but the sun comes out on a clear day, and you can you you can be very comfortable in 45 or 50 degree weather in your coat, but inside that greenhouse it can be 90 degrees or 100 degrees very quickly. So, the, the probably the best thing to do is to just you know, go in and monitor that situation, and as soon as you see that temperature, I'm looking at like 80, 85 is probably when I'll start thinking about cracking the sides a little bit to get the temperature down, somewhere in that ballpark. And that's going to depend on the time of year. And then there'll be a certain time of year when you can probably leave them open. You know, once you get to a certain where you're not worried about frost and you you know, get up in the 60s at night and leave the sides up all the time, unless it's just really rainy or something, and you don't want that water to blow back through. Great, thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Weed flamers, do they help control pathogens? Not to any great extent, just because the, the temperature is certainly high enough to kill them. But you, the, the big question is, is temperature and then time of exposure. And you probably couldn't get the length of exposure time. You couldn't get the heat to penetrate in the ground, for example, deep enough to really have much impact. Might catch stuff that's right on the surface, but there could be things just below the surface that wouldn't be affected. And you're not going to be flaming your, your uh, crop <laughs> plants. Or the plastic on your high tunnel. 
Definitely. Yeah, maybe Sean has something to say. Uh, no, I think the uh, other gentleman handled that very well. It's all about time and uh, temperature and weed flamers. You're not really trying to incinerate the weeds. It's just to raise that temperature quick enough to rupture the membranes in the plant so they desiccate. It's a very okay, short great. exposure to very high well, temperature. I think we're so gonna call the it time is very we'll short. The when questions you use we weed have for flamers. now. So thank you all. Thank you to our presenters, Dr. Besson, Dr. Siebold, and Sean. We really appreciate um, having you here uh, for this. Um, and one more plug for my like follow-up survey. Please fill that out for us. Um, and if you have any questions specifically, um, go feel free to contact our speakers or contact me and I'll get you in touch with them. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here.